Okay, um, hey everybody, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first open source bridge, so please don't be too hard, but <laughs> I'm really excited about this. So I kind of called this talk my first year of pull request because I'm a relatively young developer. I start, I've had a full-time job for about um, slightly more than a year and my open source involvement is like maybe this is a good um, point for me to reflect on what I've accomplished and where I think I'm going and how I think I can grow. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about my OSS, my involvement with open source and how it's progressed over the past few years, what I've learned and I'm going to tie it into some greater trends which I see in the open source community. So this is a really short history or, of what I've been involved in open source software. So before like 2009, before I learned how to code, I was a user of various products. Um, in 2009, I had my first commit to an open source project, um, a bug fix. And in 2010, I put some code on GitHub. And since then, I've contributed to several projects via um, patches or filing issues. Um, so, um, my slides are a little, so for me the first, um, the first point was realizing that I could contribute to open source. Um, at my first web development job, I found a bug in this library and um, my first contribution was to fix this bug with a, with a co-worker. And it was a really important like kind of aha moment for me because I didn't even realize that I could um, contribute to like some open source code. Previously as a user, I didn't have any conception of contributing back to it. And I think to this day, I still think that contributing to open source is really hard sometimes. And I don't think I will ever see myself contributing to like Linux or something like that. But um, this project was um, really easy for me to get involved in. And for me, the takeaways from this was it's really um, easy to get involved at the most basic level where it's just um, submitting one patch or one pull request to GitHub was really easy. And it also highlighted the importance of appropriate documentation. It was so easy to get started with it because the project was well documented and it was easy to get set up. So. To me, one element which I think highlights, I want to highlight through this talk is how GitHub has kind of, has influenced the pro development of open source projects. So to me, the fact, an important um, reason why I was so easy to contribute to that project was that it was on GitHub and, GitHub, and it was really easy to um, download the source code, find the problem, create a issue and attach a patch to it. And I think that this is kind of, this is a, this is a um, factor which we shouldn't underestimate. I think that before GitHub, even with SourceForge or um, other tools, it just, it, the functionality is still there, but it's clunkier when it comes to submitting an, um, submitting code, you don't know what version control system they're using, where you to download the code, what's the, you have to join the mailing list, maybe even have to enter a password and to sign up for mail, a mailman list. And you have to um, write a really formal email that's like, dear members of Paperclip, please find my attached, um, my attached code for issue number XYZ. Um, here is how you reproduce it, and then you have to send around a dot patch file. And I think think that with the introduction of GitHub and eliminating those obstacles, it really makes a very big difference for just creating and passing around these patches. So, to uh, before I did this talk, I did some research on what people had to say about GitHub and open source. And this was a quote by somebody from Wired. So I'll just read it out here. Despite the name of open source, most open source software has been created and maintained by a privileged and protected class of people. Professional developers who interacted with other developers that were a lot like them. So I actually don't really agree with that quote. I actually think it's kind of negative and it makes all of us sounds like Liner's Torvalds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but suffice to say, um, 
I think that especially at this conference, we know that we are trying to create um, create a welcoming community. But I think that the point that they are essentially trying to make is that there are barriers to entry for new developers to the project. And as I mentioned before, this could take the place of having to figure out um, where the code is hosted or finding the right email list to join. And there's always a core team which for for whom access to this is much easier. And I think that GitHub has been key in removing the barriers to these develop for these developers. So as um, as I've after creating my first pull request patch to fix a bug in an open source library, um, I've been for the past year or so I've been creating issues and patches for a variety of projects. And that has been really um, really easy to do with GitHub. It's really low maintenance. So for a traditional <laughs> trajectory of open source is kind of putting kind of putting yourself out there. <laughs> and I'll just read a quote from somebody that um, from somebody on the backbone repository. I was reporting a bug and tried to fix a bug, probably in a pretty bad way. And they said, this pull request should be closed. The code makes no sense. Sad face. <laughs> Um, but other, um, but but other than that, hold on a second. What? <laughs> With that? Yeah. What ended up happening? Did he then close it? Uh, so he well the the action item was not to accept my code but to fix some other documentation and he went and created the other documentation and I closed my pull request. So that was the story. Oh, so it wasn't your code that made no sense. Oh, it was my code. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I guess this is something that kind of happens to everybody at some point, and I think that um, when it becomes really easy to put code on GitHub, sometimes you this happens. So um, I found this quote by an um, an advocate for open source saying that people are good at fixing your mistakes and telling you exactly why you're wrong, but at the same time, I think that. Um, I guess what he, I think he's trying to say is saying that there's a lot of collaboration going on and some some of people don't do it the best way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, this is a really cute um, tweet that I got from Josh Calderimis of Travis. I had been adding some usability and UX improvements to Travis and this is, it's really nice as a new open source developer to hear this sort of thing because GitHub can be a scary place <laughs> and it's good to see that somebody else is noticing your contributions. So if I could draw a trend from my past experiences contributing to open source, I would say that I'm motivated by a desire to improve the software that I'm using. As a user of the product, I, I want to make it better w in small ways, be it fixing a bug or contributing a small improvement and I'll re-emphasize the importance of GitHub. And after one year of contributing to open source code with these small one of improvements, I kind of I find myself at this juncture where I think that it's great to make improvements to the code, but I also want to find more meaning in it. And for me that might mean um, working on longer term contributions beyond one of bug reports and that means sustained involvement in a project. So if I could draw a chart, this is um, where I started as a user and then I became like an occasional contributor by reporting bugs or fixing bugs or maybe updating documentations or small improvements and the next step is kind of like a sustained contributor. And I kind of want to draw draw a link between um, what I see as a change in open source like software like um, the existence of github makes it really easy for people to report bugs or submit patches and and this is actually something which github has been key in enabling in fact um, this is a quote I found by an open source software maintainer who I'll just read it out Many contributors said that they are reluctant to contribute because that would create require creating a Bitbucket account and forking his projects there. 
so from from my point of view as a new open source contributor, I think this is definitely true. GitHub um, removes these barriers and makes it a lot easier to contribute. <laughs> so if I was to characterize how I think that um, the influence of this new culture has been is that everyone's like, oh, fork all the projects. I think I joined there, but I meant fork. So what this means for open source projects is that everyone as a user is, but everyone is also a contributor. And what I mean by that is that it becomes a lot easier for a user to become a contributor. And this leads to the phenomenon which I can't which I call drive-by contributions or the occasional contributor where um, I see a bug in the code when I'm using it and I submit um, an issue or a bug tr or a patch but I don't necessarily follow up with it um, in the longer term. This are, um, so just some statistics to kind of to explain what this looks like in practice. Um, Half of GitHub's active user makes less than five commits per month, and less than and a quarter make only one commit. And what this active user refers to is is the is users who have made um, commits in any given month. So I would say that GitHub has enabled this entire sector, and uh, this has implications for what um, the culture of an open source software software looks like. And um, I, w um, I don't know if any of you guys went to the earlier talk by um, Ms. Plunkett or other um, speaker on engaging a full sector of the open source, um, open source community. But to me, it's clear that some people um, just want to be average. What that means is that some people are interested in maintaining this level of involvement in a project. And GitHub has, by removing its barriers, has facilitated small contributions, um, and, but with the lower average commitment. So I was just kind of curious whether any of you guys have seen this phenomenon in your project. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we switched from Subversion to GitHub around, we started around a year ago. And um, as a result of this experience, we've had to kind of, a very large project with 200 contributors. So we've had to kind of change our whole way of planning how work gets done and prioritizing and finding a way to you know, welcome in these, these drive by surprise contributions and what we were before had kind of a really strict schedule. So as a user, as an open source developer, here's how I mean I see it progressing. Like, so um, you can you can have users and you can have drive by contributors and you can have can have sustained contributors. And over time, this like uh, arrow kind of becomes fatter. You have more users becoming drive by contributors, but it's still a pretty open question how you get people to sustain contributors. So for the way I see is that GitHub has funneled a lot more users into the occasional contributor category. And I think it's important to note that these are people who otherwise wouldn't be engaged. If it comes to like a, fixing a small bug in jQuery, um, I think I'm much more likely to contribute it back to the code if it was on GitHub and I could easily fork it and submit a pull request than if I had to send an official email to the jQuery mailing list. You know, saying hi, jQuery maintainers, um, and I f think that it's an it's a chance to um, engage these occasional contributors. And my question for you guys is like, how are you dealing with them? So uh, I'll speak to what the Wikimedia Foundation is doing. 
So we are in the strange situation where running our entire project off GitHub is just not an option for us the way it is for a lot of other open source projects, specifically because we deploy to like English Wikipedia and all the other Wikimedia projects from our Git repository, and we are not willing, therefore, to host our Git repository somewhere other than a machine that we control. Uh, there's, I mean, there's other factors as well. GitHub is proprietary. We're not comfortable with our, uh, you know, such an important part of our uh, system being proprietary. But really, a, a key reason is that. Uh, but what we do is we mirror to GitHub, and therefore, if a person wants to just download our code up GitHub, that, that works. Also, we are developing some tools for Garrett, which is the source control viewer and, and code review tool we use, inter integration between Garrett and GitHub, such that if a person sub uh, submits a pull request in GitHub, a maintainer can run something on, I believe, the command line to turn that into, turn that pull request into a, a, mer a patch set awaiting merge in Garrett. Um, we have so far been a little bit not as automated as we ought to be on that, um, but it's certainly gotten a lot better. Uh, and so that's how we're sort of trying to take advantage of GitHub stuff while still using the infrastructure we need to do to, to do our work. On the social side, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, you might want to turn off your screen saver. Um, the, it seems to me like the, you know, that, that occasional contributor, our process does actually, like the, the social process we have right now really requires that the person who's contributed the code engage with us during the code review process. And so we currently don't really have a norm along that might be helpful along the lines of, okay, we try and suggest code review improvements to the original author of the patch, but if they have disappeared, then maybe after some amount of time, we something, abandon it, or maybe have a set of people who are interested in taking that kind of thing on and uh, you know, take over that patch and bring it up to standard or anything like that. Uh, and so I, yeah, our, our process is so based on, yeah, we kind of need to have an engaged person on the other side the whole time, uh, that we're not necessarily taking advantage of some of these things that are like one revision away from where they need to be. Anyone else? started doing things on GitHub a little over a year ago. Um, up to that point, all of our open source projects were either hosted on like Android is on its own hosting uh, platform, uh, doing a code at Google.com, and all Googlers who wanted to release things were directed to go there. And our developer relations team kept bugging us and said, look, we really, really want to release on GitHub because this is where all the developers are. Um, and so about a year ago, we started doing that, and now we have you know, 30 people or whatever on GitHub, and we release a bunch of stuff there. Um, but kind of to, to the point you were making is that, you know, within, you know, a week or two weeks of teams moving projects from code.google over GitHub, they're seeing, you know, five, ten pull requests. You know, and most of them are small and dry by things, but for the types of projects that we're releasing, that's totally fine. Um, and even that small amount of engagement is way better than, it, I mean, at least we know that people are doing things with the code that we're releasing. And we're actually getting meaningful contributions. It, we're running into the same issue of wanting to use Garrett for, uh, for, our, for our own teams, but we're used to having a very formal code review process. And yeah, moving things on GitHub, sometimes contributors are not used to that kind of back and forth, you know, with forward uh, blessing, you know, narrowing it down to what you wanted. Um, so, actually, I'd love to talk to you about the, uh, the Garrett integration. Um, Andre here is a good guy to talk to about that as well. But, but yeah, kind of, kind of to your point that we made a, a company-wide change to allow people to release on GitHub for exactly the reason you're talking about. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I think it's actually really interesting to hear that um, migrating to GitHub has actually um, benefited you guys in terms of measuring engagement and that kind of thing because I think that a perspective which I've kind of which I've heard is that with, with more drive by contributions it's an increased burden in terms of managing it and um, managing it and 
making sure that you know everything gets merged and I think that that's kind of the essential conundrum of like open source and growing new contributors but at the same time when the funnel really widens that much that you have this much new contributors it's a really hard task in terms of being able to manage a community. Definitely. And I think, oh, sorry. sorry. I was going to say, um, I think that um, something to keep in mind is that sometimes you do have just like those drive back contributors and like those stats that you had at the um, beginning where like, yeah. uh, something like, what was it, like 5% of people only have one pull request or something? Yeah, and uh, like recognizing that sometimes people aren't going to pro progress into the dedicated contributors. Like sometimes, uh, you know, it's just somebody who wants to fix that bug, uh, that like the same impulse that got you in. And I think like having your project be open to both models is really important. Totally. So I think that kind of, um, that kind of goes into my point of, um, Man managing expectations and being able to um, being able to support both types of contributors. One thing for me is that when I was writing this um, talk and figuring out what I wanted to say, I was trying to figure out how I wanted to become, um, where next steps would be in the process, and maybe that um, starting out with for me as a developer, starting off occasional contributions really enables me to determine projections I'm interested in. And I don't think it's true for all occasional collaborators, but I think it's definitely true for um, people who don't wake up one day and become the code god for a project. Maybe they do if they are um, the internal maintainer for a pr project which is um, supported by their company, but generally speaking, people ramp up their involvement over time. And I think that if I were to kind of have a really cliche analogy for this, um, if if GitHub has kind of opened the door for seeing what a project is like, but then the next step is actually figuring out how to get people inside the door, and that's a combination of people wanting to contribute more as well as being able to create an environment in which both models can succeed. Yeah. Um, so you. Uh to talk to someone who it has your particular perspective as not a complete novice, but someone who has really uh, come of age as a FOSS contributor in the age of GitHub. And like, you know, when you're looking at an open source project, you know, you look at that and you determine, well, okay, is this something I'm interested in? I was wondering to you, what are the signals? What are like the symptoms of oh, I'm looking at this repository, I'm looking at the communications that are happening, this is or is not one that I'd be interested in contributing to. What are some signals you look for? Right. So one thing which is um, important to me is the personal meaning of the project. And this is kind of something that I don't think is necessarily um, compatible with the GitHub model, where it's like for all the projects. Just because your user doesn't mean that, it, even if among other um, projects, I don't necessarily want to contribute to them unless they are personally meaningful to me. But the other, segment, other section, which is more um, related to what the project is like is being able to um, start off with a pull request and see that that's acknowledged and also to have a good sense of where the project is going and whether I would be an effective fit for the project. Whether, um, like for instance, I liked working on Travis because I felt that um, with my experience in web development I could easily fix low-hanging fruits that they, um, that they 
um, weren't able to tackle themselves. And that's actually kind of hard to that's actually kind of hard to determine even with the current GitHub, the way that GitHub is being managed because there's a lot of organic knowledge that kind of spreads among IRC. And I think I haven't really figured out the best way to determine whether something is a good fit, but the factors would be like, is the pro are the projects appreciative of help and are my skills like, am I able to make concrete improvements? I have some follow-up questions yeah. um, that I can wait if someone else has a Oh, no, I, I actually stopped um, after I got the first email notification that there was this like comment about how awful my code was. I actually didn't check that pull request, and I just checked it out like today to see like, what actually happened to it. So, I, yeah, that was the ending of it. Yeah, and I think that sometimes I. I think that maybe I didn't, I wasn't, I'm not interested in contributing to Backbone because it's not an area that I'm particularly interested in developing frameworks. But at the same time, sometimes you, sometimes meaning is drawn by the way that people contextualize that. Like for instance, um, if somebody had said, "Oh, you're doing," you pointed out this bug, and it was really important for us to design our API. I think that for a new contributor, that constitutes a form of meaning which is an objective. It's created. So I guess I'll just do my follow-up stuff. All right, this is, um, this is where I actually ask a bunch of questions like, if you saw such and so, like how would it make you feel? <laughs> like license, like do you actually care which code, which license, whether it's like GPL, MIT, Apache, BSD, or like, like they don't mention a license at all. Does that affect at all your interest in contributing? Um, personally for me, I don't really read licenses, but I think I should because um, maybe I don't want to contribute to a code which is, um, has a really restrictive license and doesn't follow with my, um, with my perception of how things should work. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. If it's not a, a appropriate license, which I'll define appropriate, I can't even look at the code. Uh, coming from a big company. Well, yeah, I'm asking for purpose. Or, or I know, but I'm okay. just saying for the benefit of other people who are open sourcing your code, please, for the love of all that is good in this world, put a license on it. Even if, <laughs> or you know, her. Huh? <laughs> but if any license, you know, don't. If there's no license, then it's completely useless to any large company. Like I can't touch it. I can't even read the code. It's it's. So, um, it, so Apache, BSD, MIT, any of those are fine. Uh, even you know the buy me a beer license, we can kind of sort of use those are a little janky. Yeah, there's the like the, the, basically OSI approved licenses, basically, right? Except for a Faro, that's the one we can use. But okay, that's that's another. One. So for people who care about their code being used somewhere, maybe you don't care, or you want contributions in certain places, license. I, I, I would have thought that uh, a project would want to impose one license on all of its contributors. Yes, you would think that. However, a lot of GitHub-based maintainers who are people, especially people who are a bit newer to open source, um, don't, they haven't been through as many wars as we have, and so they don't realize that, like, they haven't had the moment of, oh, crap, I wish I had properly licensed everything. It's, it's actually really complicated. Um, so th this has actually been in the news quite a few times over the last six months, and I think current estimates are something like 85% of code on GitHub has no license, like no license whatsoever. Um, and the problem is, a lot of the people, and I think the point you're making, a lot of these people intend for their code to be freely available, um, but they don't realize that you, unless you actually put a open source license on it, it's not open source. It's freely available, you know, it's, it's public, but it's not actually open source. You're not actually giving people license. The freedom and the constraints that you mentioned. Right. Yeah. And so it actually puts that developer in potential legal problems. You know, uh, uh, th there's a reason I think a lot of open source maintainers don't use licenses, and that is they don't know how. Yep. We are derailing a little bit. Here. Yes. I did want to basically just ask specifically from the newbie perspective, yes. like, how does this affect things? So it sounds like if you come across a GitHub repo that doesn't have a license at all, do you notice? Uh, no, but I think I should because in my commercial, um, in my day job, that's kind of a 
the um, repositories which I, the libraries which I use are those that have been cleared for use and those are things that, that help the project succeed beyond just having people work on it in their free time because that's an essential part. Um, I think it depends on the projects. In my perspective, in the Ruby community, there are a lot of open source libraries maintained by um, companies that are for profit, like consultancies or big companies. And those are libraries that I feel comfortable contributing to because everyone in they are used by the community. Yeah, totally. Another question, Ham, about like, does this make you more or less likely? Um, the, like, seeing that, I'm assuming seeing, uh, like, in the history, that, like, they have been going through pull requests and, like, you know, resolving them quickly. Like, that's a good sign, right? Yeah. Right. And, like, that other people have been getting, like, encouraging comments and reasonable reviews and stuff, right? Right. Right. Um, I'm kind of curious, like, you mentioned that having your own pull request acknowledged quickly is a good thing. Like, what kind of like acknowledgement, I don't use GitHub that much, but like, what should I be considering best practice here? Just like commenting and saying, I saw it, I'll get to it later, like would that count? Um, yeah, I think it's kind of like dealing with emails, right? Like, um, the best would be like figuring out what needs to get done in order for it to merge in. I think that that's the essential goal of every pull request submitter. And that might mean um, things like, oh, as detailed as pointing out what needs to be changed or pointing out like, oh, it needs tests, add some tests, or, you know, or, or even just thanks for it. I think that that goes a long way towards building goodwill. You mentioned that you yeah. really like being able to see where the project is going. Um, do you like it when, uh, like, the GitHub readme page, like, on, you know, in every repo there's that readme page, right? Like, if it links to, like, a roadmap, is that a good thing? Yes, I don't think I've ever seen a project on GitHub that has actually had a roadmap on its readme. So, um, that's a kind of hi hypothetical question. <laughs> <laughs> like, and a pony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I think that that's more a question as, um, as it goes along from occasional contributor to like more sustained contributor. And I think that... Um, as a community, like the ways that um, we get somebody from occasional contributor to sustained contributor are really varied. Maybe that means getting them involved on the mailing list or getting them involved on the IRC or having a men informal mentoring. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the Right. Um, definitely. Like, I don't. I think that um, contributing on GitHub is really different than contributing in an office environment for me, and it takes a lot of my writing skills to be able to contribute effectively on GitHub, because I've actually had technical disagreements with people on GitHub like saying that, oh, I want to implement it this way. To give a really specific example, the Postgres implementation, um, the JDBC adapter for Postgres in Java has a misspelling in one of its error keys, and I wanted to fix it because I believe that this is a broken window which should be fixed. But they were like, no, I don't want to do this because it might break people who rely on this for, um, for whatever reason. And I was saying that it's a broken window, we should fix it. And I think that sometimes you just can't win the battle, but at the same time... Um, were they nice about how they were doing the disagreeing with you? Uh, they, they were being neutral, they were just saying I disagree with you and for this reason. So actually...
Um, as far as possible, if it's like a bug, I try to submit a pull uh, issue because if it needs to be fixed for my um, project. But there's a lot of, um, t there's also times where they're back and forth, mainly f for instance because I don't know how to fix it. I think that encouraging people to submit, pull, submit real code is helpful in terms of um, communicating. Okay, so the JDBC misspelling is, you know, you didn't spend a lot of time on the code if you even done before. Yeah. But some things, you know, someone may spend a couple of days on the code, they're happy with it, they send the pull request, and then the maintainer says, yeah, you really shouldn't have done this at all because we're about to throw all this away. Or, or something, you know, it, it would be really helpful had they opened a bug first before they spent a lot of time on the code. And they, and they could have said up front, hey, don't worry about this right now. That kind of thing. Have you had any experience with that? Or? We struggle a lot with that because we don't use GitHub's uh, issue tracker, we use Bugzilla. And um, yes. like trying to get the information back and forth is like really hard. We don't have a good like workflow for that either. So. I think that's actually a really useful perspective. I, I, I don't know. As a professional developer, I kind of a lot of times I have the feelings that I should be able to solve this problem, and and I have like this like feeling that I should submit a pull request so it can get merged in. But I think that that's also unhealthy for the reasons that you mentioned. Like sometimes people might just fix it for you, or you you want to get people engaged without them feeling like their effort is going to be wasted. The contributing file? Yes. No. So GitHub support, you can, just like you can have a readme file in yeah. the end of your directory, you can have one called contributing yeah. files, and it can be like a markdown file or whatever. Yeah. So whenever someone goes to open a new issue or pull request, there will be like a bar at the top that says, hey, this project has particular guidelines for contributing to the project. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And like for us, that involves signing a CLA for Google or, you know, please file a bug before you submit code back. Is your contributor license agreement somehow uh, integrated into GitHub? It is not currently, but we are working on that. Can so, you do that? Yes. yes. So Ooh, I didn't know that. GitHub, well, it's the same way Travis works. Have you ever so, signed a contributor license agreement? No. You may someday, <laughs> and it will be easier. Not very many projects have them, in my experience. Say that again? Not very many projects have them, in my experience. Yes. If you don't freaking have a license, you can't freaking have a CLA. <laughs> what is, what is, a CLA does is it basically just makes explicit the terms on, under which you're offering your code, and like various projects have different uh, requirements and stuff like that. So it's kind of like uh, how projects explicitly license who can use their code, and CLA is the other end. Like you're licensing to the project how. Uh, um, you're giving them permission to yeah. use your code. Uh, and you're right, yeah, I, I don't see a lot of projects who uh, use them. Maybe if they agree to GitHub, more projects will. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have to point out a legal technicality that everyone seems to overlook. A license doesn't actually mean anything unless the code is copyrighted. Because the co a, a license is just permission to, to use the, something that uh, someone else is copyrighted by somebody else. Copyright exists the moment you create it. Yeah, yeah that's essentially on it. Uh, so, so something is copyrighted, is it yes. digital copyright? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. The minute that you create it in fixed and tangible form. If you do so in the United States. Yes. Well, so yes. <laughs> we can, we, we have five minutes left in the session. <laughs> okay, cool. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I have one uh, more minutes. thing. Yes. Actually, one more tiny set of things to ask you, uh, and then I could like, let other three. One is, do you find that there are there like GitHub get-togethers that you have found like helpful, where people are like, oh, let's all I don't know contribute to GitHub together, or uh, people who use GitHub get together in person. And the second is, have you run into anyone you think treating you um, differently on GitHub because they see that you're a woman? Um, 
So the first question is, do you, have I ever been to GitHub training or meetups? Like any kind of in-person get-together that's somehow based around the GitHub community. Like drink-ups. Drink-ups. That's what they have? Yes. Yes. Yeah, they, they host them around the world. Right. Yeah. No, I haven't. But maybe I should reiterate my should reevaluate. Um, and I mean, yeah. And what was the second question? Uh, do you think that you've ever been treated differently on GitHub because you're a woman? Uh, it's hard to tell. My GitHub avatar is actually of me in a sun hat. <laughs> so I look about sixteen. So I I don't know if anyone has actually treated me differently because of that. Yeah, I haven't been treated badly except for that one time that you told me my code sucked. <laughs> well, it's okay. It actually sucked. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's sorry. That's it for yeah. our, like total interrogation. <laughs> so yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity. It was actually really interesting to hear about you guys and how you deal with occasional contributors because I think that as an occasional contributor, sometimes I feel guilty that I'm not contributing more. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> um. So anyway, yeah. Um, like speaking as a project owner and maintainer, I think that the occasional contributors and the drive-by and the stuff, I, feel, I love seeing those because seeing somebody like passionate enough to want to change something means that somebody's using your stuff. Mm -hmm. It also means that you've made the code and the ramp in like easy enough that an occasional contributor can be there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a right. Great as, affirmation as yeah. A owner. yeah. Like walk-in traffic, you know, in a yeah. store. Like it says that somebody cared enough about this thing that I made to like actually improve it. So just speaking for me, and apparently many other people in this room, uh, you know, occasional con contributors are awesome. Yes, I, I, th I think actually that says something uh, positive about your project because there are projects that are, don't do not welcome outside influence. We don't have you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have both. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about open source projects that are supposedly a, a part of the community. Oh yes, I think he is too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> All right. So thanks.